contributions to food security. I'm Kristen O'Planick from USAID's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, and Environment. This webinar is jointly sponsored by Microlinks and AgriLinks. If you aren't familiar with both, I encourage you to check them out. For those who have been with us for years, I'm really excited to announce that in March, the Microlinks platform will be rebranding and upgrading to a new site named MarketLinks to better reflect its broad economic growth and market development content. So stay tuned for that. Now back to today. Despite the potential for interregional trade of grains to improve food security in Sub-Saharan Africa, most of us know that in practice, these commercial transactions get held up or even totally blocked by logistics challenges and non-tariff barriers. Today, we'll learn how USAID's trade and investment hubs, in partnership with the Eastern Africa Grain Council, are actually overcoming these issues. Our speakers have excellent stories to share as to how the hubs and the Eastern Africa Grain Council facilitated significant grain trade deals in Addis Ababa, Lusaka, and Kigali. I hope each of you will find their insights valuable and applicable to the work we're all doing, attempting to find enterprise-driven solutions and leverage markets for development impact. Now let me briefly introduce our speakers. Joining us from Nairobi, we have three speakers. Johannes Asefa serves as Director of Agriculture and Agribusiness for USAID's East Africa Trade and Investment Hub. He is an international development professional specializing in structured trade, agriculture market development, and international trade policy. Also in Nairobi, Scott Cameron is the chief of the USAID Kenya and East Africa Office of Regional Economic Integration, which is the largest regional program and technical services unit in USAID Kenya and East Africa, leading implementation of two regional initiatives, Trade Africa and Feed the Future. And finally in Nairobi, Gerald Masila has been the executive director and CEO of the Eastern Africa Green Council since 2011. The aim of the Eastern Africa Green Council is to support structured grain trade in the Eastern Africa region. Under his leadership, the organization has grown and its operation now spans 10 countries. And finally, joining us from Pretoria, Tishilo Rambuana is the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub Agribusiness Trade Director. He has worked to provide financial and institutional support to more than 17 commercial agricultural industry organizations representing over 70% of South African primary agricultural production and 14 agricultural trusts with over $20 million in assets. We also have in the room with us Jim Winkler and Elodie Manuel, who will help us manage the chat box and the Q&A. Please type your questions in as we go and don't hold back. We will address questions once the presentation has concluded. The recording will be available online after, and you will be able to download the PowerPoint. I know those are always questions. All right, with that, over to you, Johannes. Thank you, Kristen. Um, the frequency of droughts in Eastern and Southern Africa is increasing and affecting the food security of uh, the entire region. Millions of people require increasingly emergency food assistance and many more live in the shadows of starvation. Despite uh, the dire challenges facing the region due to climate change and political stability, the region has the potential to feed itself and achieve food security within a generation. The region is also blessed with vast arable land, variances in agricultural zones, and staggered plant and harvesting cycles means that the countries in the region could be uh, at surplus or deficit positions at different times of the year for any given staple grain. The food is allowed to flow from surplus to deficit regions without unnecessary barriers. The region can and will wail itself from chronic emergency food assistance dependency and feed itself. The USAID funded East, West, and Southern Africa trade and investment hubs promotes the movement of staple grain from surplus to deficit regions by addressing systemic challenges and market constraints to achieve food security in Africa. Today's webinar will discuss the efforts of the Eastern and Southern Africa Hub to promote regional grain trade to improve food security by using market forces to avail staple food grain to deficit regions at reasonable prices. 
we have to remember today we're gathered to talk about regional food trade, but it's really important to remember why it's important to do regional food trade and, and talk about food security. Food security is a really sanitized word to say, prevention of hunger and starvation. We have to understand the genesis of our work here in the region for this food trade and regional integration work. Last year, over 40 million people were affected by drought in Eastern and Southern Africa. We will show briefly a video that shows the extent of the damage caused by last year's El Nino condition in the region. Adam, can you roll the video? Okay, everybody, we're going to show a video now. Uh, I want to let uh, people know, first off, uh, I'm getting a lot of messages that people can't hear. If you're at a USAID mission or behind a restrictive firewall, that could be a problem. So uh, continue to chat with me. Don't worry, this is being recorded and will be shared out. So if you miss the live event, you can't hear me, uh, but <laughs> we'll share it out later on. Uh, so we're going to play a video now. Also look for a link to the YouTube video. Uh, if, if there are issues, if you have a slow internet connection or something, uh, we recommend that you check it out on YouTube. Uh, so we're going to break for about two and a half, three minutes, let the video play, and then we'll come back to the presentations. The devastating effects of El Nino. The lack of rain accompanied by heat waves. This is the worst drought to hit South Africa since 1982. Millions are facing water shortages. This is rather unusual because under normal circumstances, I would be waist height in water here. This reservoir has completely dried up and it just goes to show how severe the drought is. The country's farmers have been the hardest hit. Six of Tuso Galana's cows starved to death. Many more are missing. He fears the worst. He wanted to show us the dried up watering hole, only to find one of his calves trapped in the mud, close to death. There was no time to waste. More manpower was needed, and the BBC team had to put the camera down and assist with the rescue. Over this way. There you go, come on. There you go. Yeah. This is heartbreaking. I am losing out more than I should be gaining. It's only a matter of time before those who work for me become unemployed. Without some intervention, the stark reality facing many farmers is that more livestock will keep dying. And just talking about the soil itself. Many commercial yeah, farmers have dry. criticized the government's slow response in helping out. Yeah. At this stage, there's no help because of this uh, uh, drought. We are still waiting to hear what are the programs that are going to be implemented for fighting this drought. We didn't even plant, so it's going to be going to affect our food security. It's going to affect the price. And the, the poorest of the poorest that you always talk about, they are the one who are going to be worse off. The prospects of rainfall look promising, but the ever-changing weather patterns brought by climate change could still affect the country's food security. Nomsa Masego, BBC News, Free State. There you go, Johannes, over to you. Okay. So as you can see from the rest of the agenda, we just went through a, a background description of the food crisis situation in East and in Southern Africa. The rest of the agenda will include um, a discussion from our colleagues from USA, Kenya, and the Regional Economic Integration Office about the importance of regional uh, trade associations, 
we'll hear from our colleague uh, Gerald Mastilla about partnership and sustainability and the importance of working with private sector partners. And then looking at the trade opportunities in Eastern and Southern Africa, why this trade is really huge and important to address the security region. Finally, uh, challenges, nothing of this magnitude will pass through without challenges. We'll talk about the challenges and how we address the challenges we face and how we will continue to work to address these challenges. Next. Um, I'll go through quickly uh, on the food crisis issues. Again, 40 million people affected. In Kenya, alone 23 counties last year were declared disaster. Um, 2.7 million people required emergency food assistance. So this year, that number has grown to 3.2 million. Uh, many, many more uh, people, especially urban poor, have been affected by the rising food prices. Fortunately, the drought spells rarely affect the entire eastern southern uh, region, meaning that when some areas report a deficit, other areas will have a surplus. The challenge is that uh, there is no free flow of food between the surplus and deficit regions, and, uh, and there, therefore countries like Ethiopia, which had uh, last year 6.3 million metric tons, uh, the second highest harvest of maize, have difficulties of selling. In fact, at one point, the government was forced to subsidize some of that. While we had uh, countries like Kenya next door with a huge, uh, almost close to 2 million metric tons of deficit uh, for maize. Then there are other challenges, uh, infrastructure, military affairs, and logistics about preventing the movement of uh, grains in the region. As you can see from the map in general, the El Nino effect was severely, uh, had severely affected Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. But in between, you see some white spaces areas where there were opportunities where uh, surplus uh, production uh, was produced. Next. Now moving on to um, uh, my colleagues to, from USAID, uh, East Africa, and REI, Scott Cameron, uh, he'll talk about briefly about the importance of supporting regional uh, grain trade and uh, to achieve food security from the U.S. government perspective and U.S. Uh, global food security strategy perspective. Scott, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Johannes. Um, so to take a, a step back, um, uh, overall, the, the three African trade and investment hubs are the U.S. government's main platform for transforming African economies and deepening uh, the U.S.-Africa trade relationship. We see USAID's support of trade facilitation and economic integration in Africa as important tools for increasing economic development, investment, and inclusive agriculture sector growth to make our African partner countries more stable and prosperous, while also ensuring that both American and African businesses thrive. So focusing on our work facilitating on facilitating cross-border grain trade. Our initiatives specifically improve the efficiency and transparency of cross-border transactions, harmonize safety and quality standards, and reduce the time and cost of doing business in the region. The impact of these efforts is a stable and self-sufficient region with the capacity to meet emerging food crises, such as the one Johannes outlined. Uh, these uh, trade initiatives, as he also said, uh, also advance the U.S. government's Feed the Future goals, specifically increasing the access, availability, and utilization of staple foods across the region. Uh, Acting U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Donald Yamamoto, articulated this point well when he stated, if we break down non-tariff trade barriers and barriers that prevent trade from happening between the countries, then what we are going to see is not only expansion of investment in trade and opportunities, but also economic growth. And that could be the spark, the basis for other trade and development. Moving on uh, to the next slide. Um, as previously mentioned, the East, West, and Southern African trade and investment hubs are USAID's primary vehicle for trade facilitation within the continent and between Africa and the United States. Over the last several years, different iterations of the trade and investment hubs have supported economic growth in Africa by developing regional staple food markets, supporting the implementation of best practice agricultural and food trade policies and standards, building export-ready value chains, facilitating access to finance and promoting investment, modernizing custom systems and processes, creating market linkages between the U.S. and Africa under uh, the African Growth and Opportunities Act, and supporting the implementation of common markets and trade blocks. 
Some of our key results include since 2010, supporting over $320 million in new private sector investments and facilitating almost a billion dollars in exports from Africa to the United States under AGOA. Along the way, since 2014, the hubs have also helped create over 60,000 jobs. Overall, these efforts have played a critical role in creating an enabling environment for trade and investment, leading to economic prosperity. The prosperity also contributes to Africa's sustainable growth and the national security interests of the United States. Moving to the next slide. Uh, the U.S., now talking specifically about East Africa, the U.S. East Africa Trade and Investment Hub recently rolled out several initiatives that have increased regional trade and improved food security by supporting sustainable movement of surplus staple foods to deficit areas. This approach is very consistent with our new administration's priority of enterprise-driven development as a means for achieving sustainable economic growth for the countries in which we work while we help them on their development journey towards self-reliance. Specifically, the East Africa Trade and Investment Hub has supported grain trade throughout Eastern and Southern Africa by creating critical market linkages through business-to-business -business forums, hey, supporting policy reforms and regulations to support regional trade and reduce the cost of doing business, such as the harmonization of grain standards across the East African community, supporting the development of market information systems, and finally facilitating access to working finance for grain transactions. So with that, I can turn it over to the next speaker. You have been muted. Thank you, Scott. Your um, microphone has been turned on. Back, uh, nothing of this magnitude could be done just by development uh, partners. It's important to recognize the importance of working with local and regional partners to develop uh, and work with strategies that will address food security, especially specifically in this case, using trade as a means to achieve food trade. In this initiative, the, the Eastern and Southern Africa Trade Hubs worked closely with the Eastern Africa Grain Council as a partner. And these partnerships, including partnership with the region's government and the regional RECs, uh, including here in the, the ESC, were important. Uh, I'll, turn it over, I'll turn over the mic to Gerald Matilla, the Executive Director of EAG, to talk about the partnership and EADC itself, so what it stands for, and uh, the market opportunities that exist in Eastern and Southern Africa for grain trade and for future, uh, for the possibility to reach food security in the region. Thank you very much, Johannes. Um, my name is Gerald Masila, as has been said. I am the Executive Director of the Eastern Africa Grain Council. I will tackle three um, uh, topics. One, I will quickly say who EAGC is for the benefit of those who may not have interacted or known EAGC. Then I'll quickly talk about the partnership and the opportunity uh, to do with trade. So by way of introduction, the Eastern Africa Grain Council is a membership uh, organization, not for profit, that is for the grain value chain stakeholders uh, working or present in the Eastern Africa region, working in 10 countries. These are basically the five or six ESC countries and the next tier of countries. And the membership of EHGC is open to organizations, to companies, to um, farmer groups, to traders, to processors, and, and, and even the, the service providers uh, who are associate members um, in, the, in, the, in the sector, and we currently have a membership of over 350 member organizations in the 10 countries in the, in the, in the, in the ES, Eastern Africa region. And our reason for existence is, as, as an organization is to promote and to foster trade, essentially structured trade, cross-border trade, addressing barriers to trade and uh, improving transaction costs and all that. So at the end result is increased volume and value of trade. How do we do this? We have a number of uh, interventions and services that we offer at TSDC. One is that we provide market information through our uh, market information service, the Regional Agricultural Trade Intelligence Network Ratting. Secondly, we do training and capacity building for our members and stakeholders through our institute, the East Africa Grain Institute. We also are involved in the policy arena, looking at developing the policy agendas, 
uh, creating and looking for evidence and also dialogue with the policy makers to be able to create an enabling environment for the green uh, sector to thrive and this we do through a platform that brings together a number of other organizations involved. Finally, we push everything to trade. We push everything through trade so that um, we have structured trading systems and different of our flagship on that. So in this regard, we partner with the, uh, uh, the USA Trade Hub, and in this hub, uh, and in partnership with them, ENGC plays the role of being able to bring the buyers and the sellers together, and uh, through this, we were able to uh, have this successful event. So what do I see as the opportunity in this region, particularly opportunity for trade in the Eastern Africa region? Um, first of all, you recognize that Africa is a very um, large continent. It's quite big. Uh, Africa, you can say, is equivalent to several other continents like China, India, the US, and most of Europe put together. And from a population perspective, just taking the Eastern and Southern Africa region, you're talking about 664 million people. Uh, this is double the, 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 the population in the U.S. And you can see from the people perspective, there is a, uh, uh, from the land side and also from the people population, uh, there is a big opportunity in Africa in that we have the land side, we have the arable land, we've got a tropical climate, we've got irrigation potential, and we have a crop calendar that provides for this. So on the consumption front, we have a rural and urban population. We've got grain as a staple of food in this region, with, and we have grain being produced in the entire region, especially for food and for feed. And therefore, looking at, 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 at the fact that we harvest and plant and produce at different times, this is a great opportunity for trade to happen when one region harvests, one country harvests, they can sell to the other and the cycle can continue happening. And indeed, we look even from our statistics that the region is food sufficient, only that food does not move across the border. Over you, to you, uh, Johannes, as uh, 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 that. Thank you, Gerald. Um, it, it's very important to reemphasize what Gerald just said. If you look at the uh, slide 14, uh, the production is such as the regions, and then to the top calendar on slide 15, what you can see is that, especially in the 10 countries that EAGC has offices and, and members, you can find a harvest of one kind every month of the year. So at any given time, one country could be a surplus producer, and another country could be a deficit producer. So the conditions are right for the flow of surplus production to deficit regions. And it's really important to recognize that point. Now, I'll be moving over to the next set of discussion and slides. Why do regional grain trade and the regional grain trade facilitation initiative in general? It's really important to understand the conditions and the reasons. First of all, as we talked about earlier, the great um, drought that affected the whole region last year because of the El Nino condition, it's not new, but it's getting greater and more prevalent, and it's affecting millions of people. So it created a huge crisis. So there was a need to look within the region for solutions to feed the region from regional resources, from regional grown grains themselves. Second, we looked at opportunities that have the least amount of market distortion. In, in this instance, all that USA supported was enabling the region partners, especially here, EADC and its members, to do what they do best, trade, with some support, financial and technical support. So this is essentially private-driven effort with little market distortion and with a small amount of investment. The total investment uh, last year is, is about $100,000, which has resulted in, in the transaction of 1.2 million metric tons over, uh, over a value of about $400 million. Um, it also provides an opportunity for sustainability. Again, we work as catalysts to really find a solution for problems and bottlenecks that affect 
grain trade in the region. In this case, this movement of surplus to deficit the region. By partnering, working with the ABC, we All right, sorry, briefly I was muted there somehow automatically. I'm back again. Uh, so the sustainability angle is, is very important. This is part of the U.S. government, the U.S. United States uh, new focus of the global food security strategy, it, which one of the pillars is the sustainability of everything we do. Um, in, in fact, in this case, not just the AGC, but because of the process we've done, other traders who are not members of the AGC or other regional organizations have jumped on the bandwagon and will continue this work long after we've left the, the team. And then finally, uh, looking at the region's government and their efforts to provide food and nutrition to their people. And then the process of helping to balance the region's uh, food balance sheet. Um, helping governments that have surplus, in this case, for example, the GFR had 5.3 million metric tons of maize produced at no market, and Kenya with nearly uh, 2 million uh, metric tons of maize deficit. And connecting those two and helping uh, is, is another great part of the initiative. Uh, last but not least, despite our efforts uh, and our work, uh, there were challenges, but these challenges could only be met by a partnership of the private sector, the donor community, and the region's government. This provided an excellent opportunity to foster long-lasting partnerships to resolve the region, or at least to address the region's food security situation. So that's really what really started the whole process. We spent a great deal of time researching, understanding, the opportunities and challenges. Now, many of us, including myself, I worked in four African countries where against uh, structured trade and food trade. We, this is not news to us. We knew there was food in the region, but making it available and allowing it to flow was not an easy task. So we had to do a lot of work. We had to educate our partners, um, not just uh, regional governments, not just the uh, regional organizations or traders, but also regional governments and even the donor communities to make sure everyone appreciated the opportunity, but also the magic of the challenge. All right, moving on. Next slide. We'll talk now briefly about the, the B2B and the process to um, moving grain from surface uh, to deficitary. Last year, the Eastern Africa Trade Investment Hub, partnering with the AGC first, uh, did uh, a B2B in Ethiopia on March 7, which resulted uh, in, in about 300,000 metric tons of grain traded. And additional trades were concluded in Kenya, between Kenyan and Ethiopian traders specifically. Uh, similar uh, B2Bs were held uh, in Zambia on June 28 in partnership with the Southern Africa Trade Investment Hub uh, and, and eventually just recently in November in Rwanda uh, again, which resulted in general in total uh, in 1.2 million metric tons of cross-border trade uh, and staple grains, uh, resulting in a value of about $402 million. Uh, uh, the, the amount of grain traded, in our estimation, uh, will provide food security for about 14.4 million people in the region. Uh, this is very important. Also, if you look at just Kenya alone, the actual transactions involving Kenya, which are about 600,000 metric tons of grain, will cover essentially a little over uh, 60 percent or a little over 50 percent of, of uh, Kenya's uh, deficit last year. And the numbers also uh, are, are very important when it comes to farmers. Again, if you take the 1.2 million metric tons, um, the number of farmers that could have benefited or that benefited from this process are there estimated about 800,000 farmers. Uh, from this 1.2 million metric tons of uh, transaction. 
So this, this, these numbers are really important, but the numbers that we'll talk about uh, what happened really behind the numbers and what really drove this process and the challenges that, that faced us. Now, the, the 1.2 million metric tons in transactions are contracts completed or assigned at the B2B. The next process is to facilitate and support the completion of the transaction. Obviously, we had many challenges in supporting the, the traders and the businesses that participated in this process. We'll talk briefly uh, about some of these challenges. The, the slides you're seeing are pictures, I don't know how clear they are, are basically uh, a sampling of the various B2Bs we've held across uh, the region uh, last year, uh, where the businesses uh, are paired with buyers and sellers. We essentially use a speed dating model uh, to, to organize and, and uh, match buyers and sellers uh, throughout the B2B processes. Now, I would like to invite my colleague, Tashilo, to talk briefly about the, Southern, uh, the Zambian B2B session and, and their effort to support Southern Africa uh, sellers uh, to send to Eastern Africa, the Eastern Africa region, and from the Southern Africa perspective. Tashilo? Tashilo, are you there? Tashilo? Okay, we may have lost Tashilo. Um, we look forward to Tashilo, are you there? Tashilo? All right, we'll move onward forward. Moving on, let's talk about the challenges. Really, I think most of you know uh, this process and the explanations are pretty straightforward, but the challenges involved and the solutions that we tried to find for those challenges we're really the true story, I mean, the real story of this whole B2B process um, in the trade facilitation effort. I'd like to invite my colleague, Gerald, um, to really start talking about uh, the challenges uh, we faced um, in Zambia, and then uh, I'll talk about Ethiopia, and uh, we'll invite also to Shilo if he comes back to talk about, from the Southern Africa perspective, the various challenges and the solutions that we uh, found for some of the, the challenges. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, yes, we did have the uh, B2B in Zambia, and when we got into that environment, quite a number of challenges uh, uh, came up. Uh, one of the challenges was to do with logistics. In logistics, um, Zambia being quite um, landlocked, very um, inside uh, position in, in, in uh, Africa, um, you have two options. You either do a, a, a road transport up uh, through uh, Tanzania to bring to the other countries up in Eastern Africa, or you could go through again by road to the port of Beira in Mozambique and then ship across to Mombasa or to that. And here the challenge was that the costs were quite high to be able to uh, move the, the commodities across there, and we even had a, a situation where the, the rail cost, the rail quotation per ton was much more than road uh, transport quotation per ton and, and that was quite uh, amazing and a big challenge. Uh, and so that sort of limited the competitiveness of Zambia in being able to penetrate the other countries in the Eastern Africa region. Secondly, when you do a B2B and you have some substantial quantities being signed up, you know, um, uh, good qualities like 20, 30, 40, uh, 50,000 uh, metric tons, the money involved is quite substantial. And to do this, you would need, um, you know, proper trade instruments like LC, uh, and this is major cross-border trade. So for the buyers and the sellers to be able to access finance was quite a challenge to be able to get those LCs and also the, the insurance related to it. Um, next issue is that, uh, was, in fact, the initial issue was that when we landed in Zambia, there was an export ban in place, which had just been uh, opened up when we got to engage with the Zambian government, but there was a 10% tax 
on export. And, and to our to our great joy, that was one of the immediate things that happened with our engagement uh, with government. They lifted that 10 percent tax, and and that really made uh, things possible. The other challenge was to do with the standards. So the standards in Zambia being part of target and the buyers from the Eastern Africa, from the ESC community, ESC has its own harmonized standards for great and support. But the Southern Africa does not, and the text and the specifications, including some of the uh, conformity requirements, were different. So we then had to engage with the various bureaus with government involvement and, and help that uh, resolve. And finally, we had also issues of transshipment, being able to transship out of Zambia through um, the countries out there to bring to the countries in the, in the other, other parts of Eastern Africa was quite a, a challenge. And so we, we, we had to address them, and there still are challenges um, uh, that we, we had to deal with, but eventually trucks moved and the, the trade happened. All right, let, let me just go over also to what happened with Ethiopia. Um, it, you know, people ask us questions. Um, why didn't anybody else think this before? Uh, why didn't this happen before? It's simple. Historically, these regions are not connected economically to the ESC region. There's always been some transactions, but not really at a both level for various reasons. For Zambia, for example, distance was an issue. But for Ethiopia, it's right next door to the ESC. But it might as well have been Ethiopia could be Argentina. Uh, there is very little uh, trade linkage and connectivity. So the first challenge was actually creating a trade linkage. When we created the first test uh, pilot linkage meeting here in Nairobi, where we brought seven of the top grain exporters from Ethiopia to meet with Kenyan traders, it was like a family reunion of long lost uh, relatives, right next to each other, but they didn't know each other. It did take a long time for them to connect because they have shared values, shared history, shared um, culture, and, and many more that binds these countries than separates them. But very little trade took place before. In fact, for Ethiopian traders, it was easier to export maize to China and in Italy for chicken feed than to uh, export to Kenya and the ESC. They just didn't know the market existed. They didn't know Kenyans consumed 94 to 100 kg per capita per year. Uh, they just, they, the knowledge didn't exist. Uh, Ethiopia as being a, a, a different, a separate and outside of the ESC also was not linked to the ESC market in terms of trade agreements. So it lay, stayed out of the region's uh, market for, for that reason as well. But then there, there are also other reasons. There are more practical uh, challenges, uh, such as standards, as Gerald mentioned with Zambia. Ethiopia's grain standards are different from the ESG's harmonized grain standards. Um, other issues, including uh, logistics. Ethiopia's drive on the right side, the Kenyans drive on the left side. The axle load limitation in Ethiopia is much higher than Kenya. Ethiopia is 40 tons per truck, and Kenya is 26, and so on and so on. And financial uh, sector connectivity is very low, so payment systems were another challenge. The region, the two countries, uh, at least the Ethiopian banks, were not accustomed to dealing with Kenya and East African banks, so it's very difficult to do uh, payments and to create a, a, a smooth transactional process. But also, Ethiopia has a very unique uh, foreign currency control system that uh, constrains the ability of traders uh, to trade with others. And, and this challenge added a burden, again, and a transactional cost to the, the relationship. Finally, the, an opportunity that was a barrier in the past was infrastructure, right? Previously, until two years ago, there was no tarmac road linking Nairobi to the, the border uh, town of Moyale, which is a common town between Ethiopia and Kenya. But just two years ago, uh, a beautiful tarmac all-weather road was completed. That, again, made it easier to trade, but it was a, a major challenge in the past. Finally, because Ethiopia is out of, out not a member of the EAC or has not integrated with the Kometa Customs Territory, Ethiopian grain 
is taxed, uh, there's a duty of 50% on it. Uh, this, this is another major challenge. This is a challenge, again, EAGP worked with the government of Kenya to address uh, in terms of the uh, lifting of the, the common external tax or the making of the application of stay-up application to remove uh, temporarily the tariffs to allow grain to flow to, to Kenya. Uh, so th these were the, then there was, there's also one more challenge with the COC requirements, the uh, conformity of quality certification, rules of origin, SPS certification. All of these requirements are different. For example, the Kenyan government has appointed SGS as their agent in Ethiopia, but SGS doesn't have an office in, in Addis or in anywhere in Ethiopia. Samples have to be sent to Kenya, and it takes on average about two weeks to get samples processed. We had to intervene with our partners with the AGC to work with the government of Kenya at the highest level to create a simplified process of conformity for quality. We did the same, uh, by the way, in Zambia, working with the Minister of Finance as well as the Minister of Agriculture uh, to simplify the process uh, of compliance on quality. This does not mean where the quality standards were lowered. It's just the documentary and the bureaucratic requirements were reduced. The steps taken for uh, an exporter to fulfill the requirements were narrowed and expedited. So the border agencies, for example, on the Kenyan side, worked closely with the Minister of Agriculture, with His Excellency Willie Bett, uh, to, to, to make sure there was a simplified and unified coherent process. In many countries, these agencies don't talk to each other, let alone work together. But this crisis gave us an opportunity to bring together uh, with the minister the various border agencies and to make sure there was a simplified uh, process for compliance and rules of uh, origin uh, conformity. And anyway, at the end of the day, uh, the biggest achievement, I think, through this process and in terms of achieving uh, or meeting the challenges was really the training and connecting these traders. For example, with the Ethiopia B2B, what we found out is moment after we concluded the first B2B, Kenyan and East African traders in general were making trips on their own and visiting Addis to make additional deals and transactions. And now, unfortunately, um, as big as the transactions were concluded at the B2B, Many of them were not fulfilled because of the various challenges I mentioned I went through. One of them, the biggest of all, is export bans. In Ethiopia, the export ban still persists. There's an exception to the ban, and the exception is basically a permitting process that allows commercial farmers and unions and government parasitals to export. Working through that process with our partners in Ethiopia, the Addis Ababa Chamber of Commerce, we were able to get uh, not many but few really high quality exporters to be able to export. Uh, and that allowed for the opening of the first time ever large scale commercial grain trade between Ethiopia and Kenya. This is historic, folks. This has never been done besides the small amount of smuggling of few traps here and there. There's never been a transparent, large-scale grain trade between Ethiopia and the EAC region ever, ever before. This is monumental. What this allows us is for Ethiopian farmers to be able to sell to Kenyans. And for Ethiopian farmers, this is a food security response as well. Maize is not consumed in Ethiopia as a staple. It's a cash crop, mostly produced for uh, alcohol, local brewery of alcohol, animal feed, and a small amount mixed with other grains uh, for baking and, and feeding. So the, the farmer's ability in Ethiopia to sell would mean the ability for them to build assets and uh, to live a healthy and better life. Um, Gerald, I'll invite you to say a few more. Uh, I don't know. If you uh, skip uh, or if you, if you want to add to the challenges and the solutions we, we were able to find, I, I think your Highness, you you have um, you you've addressed them uh, quite well. The, 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 the real life challenges that, that we, we face, 
um, and, and, and how we were able to, to resolve them. Um, uh, uh, quite interestingly, especially working with, with government, working with the other partners, uh, particularly the government, without them giving us the duty waivers for the common external tariffs, it would have been difficult to get the Ethiopia maize coming into, into Kenya because it would have been subject to a 50% uh, uh, import tax, and that would have meant uh, not possible to get in. Uh, like Johannes also said on the facilitation, government was able to line up all the trade facilitation agencies, the plant health people, the Kenya plant health inspection, uh, who were able to give the import, import permits for the grain. We had also the bureaus of standards, you know, are present and are operating at the border to, to get all the transactions done, the revenue authorities, and, and also even the participation of the uh, government strategic food. So that, that really uh, worked well and, and helped uh, quite uh, significantly. Gerald, can you briefly talk about also the work the ATC did in Zambia in bringing the Minister of uh, Finance and Agriculture to Kenya uh, to facilitate the reduction of the documentary requirements for COC? Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, so when we were in Zambia and uh, we uh, established those challenges that I enumerated earlier on, on uh, that really needed uh, attention, we were uh, quite um, um, lucky to also get in Zambia the audience of a uh, key minister. We had the Minister of Finance, uh, Honorable Felix Mutati, attending and opening our B2B in Zambia. And we also had the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Dora also uh, being, being, being represented. And so we were together with the stakeholders, were able to give a memorandum to the government of, the, of Zambia, giving suggestions on how those challenges could be, could be dealt with. So there and then, the finance minister announced the lifting of the 10% tax, like I say, and uh, we suggested that EAPC, we suggested to them to reach out to their counterparts in Kenya uh, basically the Minister of Finance in Kenya, Minister of Trade in Kenya, uh, Minister of Agriculture in Kenya, and we as EACC got in touch with them, connected the two, of course they know each other, they are colleagues, they work well, but we were able to get appointments in Nairobi within 24 hours. And the week that followed, uh, we had a high delegation uh, a team from Zambia led by the Finance Minister that came and met the, the counterparts in Kenya, and they were able to go were able to go through all the issues and agree on the facilitation and, and how both governments will cooperate to support private sector to do the transactions so that the transactions are done and that the buying and selling is done by private sector but the government uh, provides all the other necessary facilitation. So we did have, we, we had um, um, meetings in Nairobi uh, that were quite, quite uh, again, historical. For the very first time, we did have uh, such a kind of uh, engagement at that level, and, and, and we have able to get resolutions and agreements, and they were all followed up and affected. Um, just, uh, just I want to add a little more on, on the Ethiopia uh, side of the, the process. Now, you know, people will ask, last year, for example, 8 million people needed emergency food assistance. Um, Ethiopia. Why is Ethiopia exporting maize? It's a very simple question, unless you know Ethiopia or the region. There's never been, and I dare say, or maybe very minimal food aid that included maize. Maize is not consumed as staple in Ethiopia. But Ethiopia and general partners over the last 10 years have done a great deal of work to improve the production and productivity of maize. The given has now become the most productive and the largest producer of maize in Eastern Africa. But with that productivity, it's produced as a, as a commercial crop, not as a staple. For Ethiopian farmers, it's an important additional income, it's an additional uh, asset to buy uh, grains of their choice, as tabs and meat and, uh, and other uh, staples not grown in the main growing region. There are essentially 9 million farmers that produce the 5.3 million metric tons of maize. In fact, it constitutes less than 10% of the calorie intake of the average Egyptian, meaning maize consumption. 
So the main is really, it could be as, as considered like coffee or tea or, or else, uh, something else. So, but these farmers live on the edge of disaster. They live on the edge of receiving emergency food assistance. So when they have good harvest of maize, if they are not able to sell at reasonable price, they in turn will be added to that 8 million people who need emergency food assistance. So last year, if, if you have been farmers were not able to export that maize to Kenya and East Africa, the 8 million number could have easily been 15 million or 14 million people who would have needed emergency food assistance. So in our view, assisting Ethiopian farmers export is a food security response to Ethiopia's food emergency needs as well, right? In fact, I'll give you a, a very good, uh, important uh, uh, event that took place. About 10 years ago, yeah, Ethiopia yeah. had a bunker harvest in Maine, and prices collapsed so low that the bag cost more than the maize itself. That region that usually produced a huge amount of maize stopped producing maize, and now they produce economic streets for export to Sudan. Essentially, they stopped producing food. It had a devastating impact on the region, on the country's food balance sheet. So it's really important to provide farmers who produce cash crops here, in this case, to provide markets to facilitate and support them to receive fair market value for their produce. Again, on the Kenyan side, instead of importing maize from Mexico at exuberant prices, which you would have taken three months to reach, here you have a neighboring country that produced a bumper harvest, a good quality, high quality maize that's really grown for flour, right? Uh, available at a reasonable price. The price of maize from Ethiopia was much cheaper than maize from Mexico and elsewhere. It was very competitive. So eventually what happened actually when it started, because of the bumper harvest, prices had been collapsing in Ethiopia. The government was forced to actually subsidize maize in Ethiopia. They had started providing the meager resources they have to subsidize the buying of maize by the national parasitical uh, grain trading agency. But the B2B, even the news of the B2B, uh, uh, the arrival of East African buyers increase the price of maize locally to a fair market value. It increased by 30% in a very short amount of time. And, it, and what happened last year in Ethiopia was because of the bumper harvest, traders did not buy ahead and hold maize. Normally traders come in and harvest by a cheap price, hold it, and then sell it later. But last year because of the uncertainty of the market conditions, traders didn't buy it. And fortunately for the farmers, they were holding large pots of maize. This allowed farmers to actually get a good, a good portion of the total export uh, parity price uh, value of what was exported, which now resulted going forward to this year. This year, Ethiopia is again having another great year in maize production, largely because of the incentives, the market incentives provided to the farmers. In fact, last year, if you have been made harvest was affected by army wars and the rain uh, cycles were reduced from last year, but they were still able to produce more because farmers increased the acreage they planted because they got good returns the last year. So again, allowing and helping Ethiopian farmers to trade with their neighbors and sell to deficit regions is a food security response to Ethiopian farmers and a food security response for Eastern Africa. Now, uh, without further ado, we'll go to the next um, uh, part of it. We'll just summarize uh, the key takeaways from, from our discussion today. Uh, we've simplified and, and, and generalized uh, the takeaways, but I think you've gotten a feel for the details of the various issues we dealt with throughout last year with this regional grain trade facilitation process. We've identified about four key uh, takeaways. The first is, I think this is the realization that East and Southern Africa, the Eastern and Southern Africa region has the capacity to treat itself and sees reliance of food aid. Uh, it, it is not unreasonable or, or hopeful 
just to think that the region could be food secure within a reasonable, within a short amount of time. We believe it can be if trade barriers are removed, if the region is integrated further. Jim Winkler, I'm the technical representative for the two hubs based here in Washington. Uh, one of the questions is how does USAID work with DFID and World Bank and coordinate with them? Um, the East Africa Trade and Investment Hub has a memorandum of understanding with Trademark, um, which is a multi-donor, I think uh, nine donors fund it, including um, DFID and the World Bank and USAID and others and they work on the trade facilitation corridors across the region. So uh, they have really enabled the movement of grains and other uh, product across borders, across East Africa community that has been critical. Uh, the World Bank also has a program in Southern Africa that uh, the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub coordinates with. Uh, there's also a DFID Food Trade East and Southern Africa program that is working on both seed trade and harmonization across East and Southern Africa, as well as uh, policy and... Sorry, uh, we lost you for a moment. We're back. Okay. I'm just answering a quick question here hi. on... on uh, hi, uh, Johannes. On, uh, on one of the online okay. questions about how USA coordinates with the World Bank uh, and DFID, and I'm just closing that out. Someone else asked a question about seeds and how important well, actually, that before we go mm -hmm. to USAID, I'd also like to comment on that. Uh, as uh, Jim was talking about, um, this is Scott Cameron, by the way, uh, from Kenya East Africa Mission. Uh, we, as Jim was men correctly mentioning, we do have uh, we do do a lot of work with uh, Trademark East Africa, which does have uh, nine donors. Uh, we are heavily active on the board. We meet uh, quarterly on the board, but we engage regularly throughout the year. Uh, that program in and of itself is about a $600 million program focusing primarily on trade facilitation and the work we do uh, at the ports and along the main uh, trade and transit corridors and uh, northern through, that go through Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, we have spent uh, hundreds of million dollars on infrastructure improvements and systems improvements at, at ports, on roads, feeder roads, as well as one-stop border uh, cro crossings, which have customs officials from both both countries along the border in order to reduce the cost of doing business. And I think one great thing about that, is, as we've seen, is about 40% uh, of all costs associated with trade, and this is inclusive of, of food, is coming from these transit and logistics costs. And so by, and this kind of somewhat addresses some of the other questions, by addressing some of the infrastructure constraints, uh, and even at the port alone, if you uh, address some of those constraints that we've been dealing with as a donor community, uh, you can cut the cost by 50% of uh, trade and transit costs. So there are significant savings that we can do, and I think this is a perfect example of how across many donor agencies, across many countries, we have uh, been collaborating very well. Thank you. Yeah, just to add a quick uh, uh, answer uh, to the question, you know, we consulted and worked with, uh, exact, for example, with Food Trade East, Eastern and Southern Africa, which is funded by DFID. We consulted and um, discussed the various issues uh, involved in this uh, regional uh, cross-border grain trade with uh, WFP. Uh, our partners, uh, EATC, for example, are part of what's called the Mass Group, uh, the, the Market Analysis uh, Working Group that works with the FAO, WFP, uh, USA, TUSNET, uh, and, and a few more other agencies. And so. Uh, this is really a, a collaborative process. So we've consulted widely, we've researched the issues, we've met with governments, with other partners, uh, various partners involved in this process, and we eventually arrived at a proposal, at a strategy, and worked with, with our mission, uh, with Scott and his team, uh, to be able to, to implement this strategy. There's a great deal amount of 
uh, front end work that in collaboration and consultation uh, had taken place before we actually did the first B2B. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to wrap up uh, today's presentation uh, and we'll move forward to uh, the Q&A portion. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to call upon Chris, I'm sorry, I, I rushed to the Q&A. I mean, there's some really great questions and we're eager to answer them. Chris, then over to you. Sure, thank you. So, Jenna Lacey has asked us, what are the hubs and USA doing to ensure that this transaction-based approach is sustainable? How are you working to ensure that these aren't just one-off successes? All right, um, so I will uh, quickly provide a quick answer and I'll invite my colleague Gerald to, to also talk about this. Um, as I said earlier, when we did the ATFL B2B, um, not even days after we concluded, there were traders already going to Addis and, and transacting. So we just opened the gates for them. We educated traders on the various technical barriers, standards, payment terms, logistical challenges, even cultural issues about trading. For example, payment, Ethiopian traders will only use LCs and will only use the CAD or cash against document process. They will not use any other method. This is foreign to some of the EAC traders. But once we, we were able to break the barriers and make the connections, these traders didn't need us. They continued to trade and connect uh, with traders, uh, with Ethiopian traders. Same thing with Zambian traders. Um, some, of, some of the Zambian traders, for example, have set shop uh, in, in Rwanda, in Kenya, to be able to further facilitate their own trade. But it, it, the most important part of the sustainability model for us is really we don't do this work. This is really an activity of the EAGC to benefit their members and the regions. We provide technical support using the small amount of money we have and the internal know-how we have, working closely with the EAGC to provide these solutions. In, through this process, for example, we're working closely with the agency to help them open an office in Ethiopia. They never had an office. They've had members, but not an office. Right now, we're going through that process. We also collaborate with them in their opening office process in Zambia. Over to you, Gerald. Yes, yeah, thank you, Johannes. Um, yeah, one of the things I would like to say is that these B2Bs and the trade facilitation processes are now embedded as part and parcel of EAGC services to the members. So they will not end now. In fact, they're, they're being institutionalized, and, and, and we are even going, we're already using technology, using our GSOCO platform to take these B2Bs to another level. So in summary, this will be continuing because it's embedded as part and parcel of EAGC day-to-day -day services to the members. Kristen? Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple questions here that are related. Jill Luxemburg asked, how is food safety being addressed under the program? Are aflatoxin levels being measured? And par partnering with that, Margaret McDaniel asked, along with aflatoxin monitoring, are pesticide residues being monitored? This is particularly important as farmers become more desperate about fall armyworms. All right, I'll invite Gerald to respond to that question. Yeah, thank you. The as we said earlier on, um, the, the question of standards and grades uh, has been central in this B2B, and uh, one of, it was one, and it is one of the prerequisites to the trade that the quality parameters are done. So how is this done? Is that for all the transactions in the B2B, you have to get your test analysis, your lab test, your your analysis, your grading certificate that confirm that the consignment being uh, transshipped or shipped across has met all the quality para parameters, which include aflatoxin levels. So the, the, the response I would like to give is that that is, is, is a, a, a feature, something that is a prerequisite and is happening in each and every of these cross-border B2Bs that we are doing. Uh, that covers and ensures that there is absolute food safety and the quality parameters and quality standards are met. Thank you. And I want to add a, a very important caveat. It's, it's really important to understand this is formal trade, right? 
Um, it previously, trade existed between these two regions, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and the, uh, the Horn of Africa and, and Eastern Africa. But it was largely underground. It was smuggling, uh, illegal trade. So the illegal uh, or informal trade did not comply with standards. Aflatoxin, pesticide residues, it did not involve any of that. We facilitated formal, transparent, large-scale transactions, right? So no quality standards or requirements were compromised. The work we did was to simplify the bureaucratic documentary requirements and process, making sure border agencies talk to each other and reduce or eradicate redundancies, right? So the, the crisis gave us an opportunity at the highest level. I mean, it's just to, to give you an example, with the, the Kenyan, the, the president of Kenya, at one point, was considering ordering the army to go to the border and pick up names from Ethiopia, because Ethiopian trucks could not cross the border. But th that level of attention gave us an opportunity to identify these barriers and work hand in glove with government to address this emergency not by compromising quality standards, but making sure the standards are met with less and less costly bureaucratic processes. Great. Is that? So um, we've got a couple questions related to a bit more the nuance of the B2B events. Lindsay Bigaman asked, how did you identify the grain traders who participated in the B2B events, and what did they need your support for? And then Celia Gare asked, what has been the role of host governments during your B2B sessions, if any? Great job. Thank you. I will take those two questions. The first one on how we identify the grain traders. The traders that we were able to get for both sides, the supply side and the demand side, are members of EAGC and those that were and, and other prominent grain traders that were able to, 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 to bring on board. So, and this is where the partnership uh, process becomes now important because if the hub maybe tried to do this without working with EAGC, they would have had difficulty identifying. But working with EAGC, we are membership, we have the members, we're able to get them. But in addition to that, and particularly in Ethiopia, I think also in Zambia, but in Ethiopia we placed an advert where we also opened up an invitation and uh, that also helped because in Ethiopia, like Johanna said earlier on, we have a membership but we don't yet have offices. So we use that process to, uh, to, to get to where the public to know and in the process we actually ended up um, uh, recruiting quite a number of members into EADC from Ethiopia. So that's how we did it, how, how we identified the green trader. With regards to, to the role of the government, I, I mentioned earlier that in all these B2B, we had government representation present. In fact, the B2B were officially, the official opening was done by the government uh, officials in Ethiopia, in Zambia, even in Rwanda, and, 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 uh, and, and therefore they provided their support and backed up the processes. But in addition to that, we had like Ethiopia uh, East Africa connections and the issue of the duty waiver. We could not have gotten this without the government helping us, both the host government and also the receiving government. And also, like I mentioned earlier on, the whole process of the documentation, the, the certification, the licenses, the permits, uh, the clearances across the borders, uh, because this was all pure formal trade where every single piece of, of compliance must be met. Uh, this, again, was made possible with the support of the government. Thank you. Just, just to add from, from our perspective, from the house perspective, what we've done also, in addition to what EATC has done, we hired a consultant, an Ethiopia-based consultant, to support Ethiopian traders, again, to go through the compliance process. They never traded with the EAC uh, member country traders. And uh, meeting these requirements uh, uh, were very complicated. Um, not just the EAC requirements, but also the Ethiopian 
export ban posed a huge challenge. The documentary bureaucratic requirements were very difficult. So our consultants worked hand in glove with the traders, uh, worked with the Adisawa Chamber of Commerce, which was our local partner and our partner at the AGC as well on this process to make sure uh, that all of the requirements were met and members and, and traders understood uh, what needs to be done. But even more important for us as, as a project, we need to make sure we had documentation and we tracked the trade. So we were able to collect contracts, payments, uh, even pictures of trucks crossing the border. We know at some point no one was going to believe us 100,000 metric tons was, was crossing over to, to Kenya from Ethiopia. And it just would be laughable if, if you say that to anyone in a year where Ethiopia had 80 million uh, people needing emergency food assistance. But again, if you don't understand the background, the context, yeah, people would be surprised. So we have to work very hard to make sure we document uh, the process uh, with the help of our consultant. Kristen? Great, thank you. And I have a question here for Scott specifically. How has food aid policy changed um, due to some of this learning? And is this a solution for future crises? Um, so in terms of food aid policy, I mean, I think that is something that is evolving over time. Uh, initially, when we were talking to our food aid colleagues related to some of the B2B work we've had in the movement of staple food around the region, it was actually approached with some suspicion, given that, you know, taking food from one country to another, but like, well, we're trying to educate people not only through uh, conversations like the one we're having now, but also our colleagues in the humanitarian assistance side is that, you know, with the understanding that, that the region can feed itself. It's these barriers that are preventing food from moving across borders, again, from areas of surplus to deficit. So by breaking these down, and over time, if we look at the system, uh, as the whole region as a system, and one common market versus independent, uh, independent specific countries and with, in silos, then I think that's the problem we get to. Oftentimes, as the U.S. government, USAID, uh, in general, we're very siloed, and we look at things country by country, and it's not often we take a step back and take that regional approach. So saying that, things like this and educating people about the broader benefits and uh, possibilities around this type of approach in terms of private sector-led, in terms of the potential for sustainability over the long term, I think this is kind of the first step, and I think over time we will get even uh, more success with this model, and I think more, more and more people will recognize that both inside and outside the U.S. government. Great, thank you. I've got a couple questions related to kind of data and tracking. So Mark Lundy asks, in addition to tracking trade volume, have you also been able to track changes in grain sales prices for consumers? And if so, how have those varied? And Dorothy Tuma from Uganda asks, how are you able to obtain true or accurate figures on the value of transactions between B2Bs? Could there be some underreporting, and thus the value of the trade generated might actually be higher? All right, I'll tackle both. Um, in terms of uh, pricing, I think it's been very public in the EAC, especially here in Kenya. In fact, the government introduced a subsidy program to uh, limit the growth of uh, food prices for two kilo made flour, which is really a, a major staple for the average folk uh, here in Kenya. It's a, an essential food security issue. So it, eventually through the government, the government directly, by the way, bought 50,000 metric tons with our help for the, the, the food subsidy program, which was uh, then sold to millers at subsidized uh, price. And eventually the price of two kilo uh, made flour dropped from almost two dollars to about a dollar thirty, uh, a huge amount of drop. Now we did not participate in the subsidy program. It had the distortive effect in the marketplace. Uh, it was well intentioned, but may not may not have ended up uh, helping the market. But it did end up consumers. It reduced the average cost of made flour in Kenya, uh, and in general in the region. I can give you there. There's been studies. For example, Rwanda had the smallest amount of uh, price rise, to about $400 per metric ton. That's partly unique to Rwanda because the Rwanda grain reserves were well managed and were properly managed, 
and the maize purchases uh, they were able to take in, for, for example, from uh, Zambia. A lot of the maize that Rwanda bought came from the Zambian B2B process, allowed Rwanda to stabilize uh, local maize wholesale prices. So in, in general, it had a, a significant and visible impact on, on uh, retail uh, market prices. A again, it's just, prices is really an outcome of supply and demand. You increase supply, prices are going to fall. Now, by all means, it's not just our work. The, you know, private traders, millers, and even some governments have directly imported also from outside of the region. Kenya, for example, has, I think, imported close to 300,000 metric tons uh, from Mexico and elsewhere, in, in addition to what um, Kenya has bought from Ethiopia and Zambia. Um, I'll come in on the question of uh, tracking the data and, and, and whether it's accurate, and, and just emphasize that what we have done and we are doing with the B2B is formal trade. And with formal trade, you have every piece of documentation with you, and therefore you are able to get the data very precisely of the quantities that are being bought and are being uh, shipped across the border. So for formal trade, there is no uh, issue in getting the data. Thank you. Now, just to add to that, the, the challenge for us is that conditions change, even after the B2B prices. Uh, there are time, sometimes times elapse uh, bet between what happened at the B2B and at delivery point. Prices may change, uh, cost of logistics may change, new policies may come up uh, and, and, and slow down the delivery process. So sometimes there, there are price changes, but we do try, we do our best to follow up and capture the final delivery price and quantity. We're not always successful, but we do our best. Great, thank you. Um, they, related to something that you just actually talked about in terms of the private trade that's going on beyond you guys, Loretta Burns mentioned, I was in Zambia a few years ago when they were overflowing with maize that the government had procured from farmers and traders, but at great, great cost to the government. I believe they sold at a loss. Are there traders and companies in place that can acquire sufficient amounts for international trade without government subsidies? So back to that sustainability question. Yeah, I'll take that question and uh, and, and specifically say that uh, this being uh, the case in, in one in uh, in uh, Zambia, when we did the B2B, uh, of course we had buyers from the whole region. We had buyers from Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Tanzania, Malawi, Kenya, Uganda. We had the whole region, and those that managed to sign the B2B contract and and, and do the delivery were all private traders who were able to buy the grain themselves and, uh, and bulk it and, uh, and do the whole trading um, and, and, and they were able to access the grain. However, in that process also, we are also aware that uh, around that time, the government then, uh, was quite aware that uh, the next harvest was coming and they still had substantial stocks in their uh, strategic reserves and they also did offer for sale uh, quite a number of their of their stocks, quite a bit, uh, a good percentage of their stocks out into the trade. But 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 uh, I would like to respond to the um, to Loretta and say that yes, indeed, some particular private traders, private companies, were able to acquire sufficient quantities and and, and uh, do trade and and move quite uh, good volumes across the region. Thank you. But also, just to add, uh, it's an important element of strategic grain reserve management. You have to uh, replenish or change what's reserved. Otherwise, quality deteriorates if you keep it over a long period of time. So it's, it's a good practice for governments who, who manage strategic grain reserves uh, from time to time, even if there's no uh, market crisis, but the reserves to, to uh, sell and, and buy new harvests or new uh, crops. So it's, it's, it's part of a good practice, a good management practice, and not always designed to subsidize uh, traders or, or consumers in that sense. So there's another use for without uh, buying and selling process. Great. 
Uh, you'll notice we just put up the, the polls that we have at, as we come to a close here. We've still got a couple questions, so don't log off quite yet, but please go ahead and answer those polls for us. All right, we've got a couple questions about informal trade, which you touched a little bit upon already, but let's go ahead and address these as well. Marietta Stevens asked, um, said, informal trade is a major challenge. What are some of the strategies put in place to have more of the informal trade information captured? Um, and Emily Miller also contributed, who are the cross-border traders that you are addressing? Does it include women in more informal cross-border trade? And if included, how is the capacity being addressed? Thank you. I'll, I'll take those questions and, uh, and uh, refer us back to the intro that I've given um, about EHC. And one of the things I say was that part of our services is that we do provide market information um, through our regional agricultural trade intelligence network rating. And in rating, we monitor border points and we monitor markets. In fact, at the moment, we are monitoring 42 markets in the region and 15 border points. And we do monitor both formal and informal cross-border trade. Um, and, and we do uh, get uh, data on the informal cross-border trade taking place in the region um, um, that, 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 uh, that uh, we're able to record and give. If you do uh, you visit www.rating.net, you should be able to, to get quite a lot of that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, especially with regard to capacity building of the informal traders, we also have uh, a number of training programs through our institutes the Eastern Africa Grain Institute, and in this we are able to uh, handle quite a number of topics like for service handling, uh, we expose the traders to the grades and standards, we also, you know, and, and the whole handling process, and also we are able to connect them to the market across the borders, uh, those that are doing the informal trade, and we try as much as possible to also make them, you know, um, also get a little bit more sophisticated to formalize their trade. And luckily, we've been having initiatives in the, in the region, with the regional economic communities, coming up with simplified, um, simplified regimes and simplified uh, processes that can, uh, can uh, move the informal trade too formal, but with a fewer set of, of documentation and without compromising on quality and, and on, on the safety of, of the food. So basically, I would like to just say that very, very quickly, um, and, and to say that uh, also women, uh, when it comes to cross-border trade, definitely they, they, they do play a, a major role, and we do have um, a, a particular support towards them, even especially those that also go to a level of being able to operate warehouses, um, as, as, as like a diva manage the warehouse kind of uh, process. So in, in general, I'd like to respond that way. Uh, but remember, our topic today was looking at trade, particularly the B2B, which are more formal arrangements and formal setups. Thank you. Uh, just to add to, to Gerald's uh, uh, answer, the, the hub uh, also works, uh, again, work, works with informal cross-border traders. Um, last year, with, in partnership with Agmark, a regional organization, we helped uh, the uh, with the establishment of the East Africa Community uh, Small Cross-Border Traders Association. We worked with uh, 42 different cross-border traders associations. In fact, about 20,000 metric tons of the B2Bs reported in our 1.2 uh, million metric tons came from uh, these B2Bs that we supported through our partnership with Agmar. That process involved the training the cross-border traders association on structured trade, on access to finance, on standards, and the like, on, on the logistics issues, but also on regional grain trade. This is very, very important to us. Uh, this year, we'll be specifically focusing on the eastern part of the EAC region. We'll be working specifically uh, with women cross-border traders and trader associations to build our capacity, again, on formal trade grain standards, uh, documentary requirements, uh, structured trade, uh, and logistics uh, management, and, and the like with, with another uh, regional partner uh, in the region. We've also worked specifically with women cross-border traders, uh, training them on how to access the regional finance uh, for, for trades like trade finance, 
for SMB financing. Uh, and we've also worked with women and, and small cross-border traders on making uh, new technologies availing, uh, available to them. So there's a lot of work that we do with cross-border traders uh, because it's important. In the ESG region, about 60% of the overall grain trade is informal. So you can't really ignore it. We work very hard to, to make sure that that 60% is reduced to a smaller amount and will have greater amount of um, uh, formal transparent trade in the region. Thank you. I think with this, um, we're, we're running out of uh, time. The allocated time, I, I'll give you back the mic, uh, Kristen. Okay, great. Uh, Scott, did you have any closing remarks on your end? Uh, no, I'm not, not prepared, but I mean, I do think this is a, a very impressive model going forward. I mean, it, while uh, there are several issues that still need to be addressed throughout the region in terms of movement of staple foods and food security at large. Uh, I think this is a great example of how we can work closely with the private sector and help unlock the potential and, you know, the food production that is already there in the region. So, but thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much to our speakers. And thank you to our audience for joining us today and bearing with some of our technical difficulties. It's always a challenge when you're pulling people across uh, far-flung geographies. I think we'll, we'll see if we can give Shishilo a chance to maybe uh, put some of his responses into a blog post that can accompany the event resources since we lost his audio. Um, and Keep your eyes open for uh, when we send out our post-event resources email. It will have links to everything you need to share this with your colleagues or go back to, to revisit anything you'd like to review. Um, and next month, mark your calendars, AgriLinks and MicroLinks will be joined by the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance featuring research from Purdue on seed storage, marketing, and finance. And that will be February 22nd, so we hope to see you back then. And that will also include an in-person component for those of you that are based locally in Washington, D.C., so you can join us live or remotely. We hope to see you then. Have a good rest of your day.